50. Tim was on duty, standing watch at the outer door, when his father appeared. This didn't surprise Tim, apart from the fact that his father had been dead for 20 years, and, when alive, had lived several thousand miles away. Hello, Tim, he said. He was smoking his pipe and wearing the sweater that he had always worn. Well, not always, but a lot. Dad, he said, what are you doing here? I came to see you. You didn't need to do that, Dad. You didn't need to go to the trouble. I've been worried about you, Tim, he said. About you and your brother. Why, Dad? Tom's okay. I'm doing okay, too. We're both working, and we're making good money. It's not that, said his father, drawing deep on the pipe. It's just that, well, I don't know how to put this, son. Are you sure you're ready? Ready for what, Dad? If you have to ask that, you're not ready, son. And what about your brother? I haven't talked to him about it, said Tim. I'm not even sure I know what you're talking about. Things are going to change around here, son, said his father. Which team will you be on? Will you be on the winning team? Do you have good hustle? I want to be on the winning team, Dad, said Tim eagerly. I'd like to think I have good hustle. Your brother... I think he may have dropped out of the game, said his father. Are you ready to sub for him? Tom, he said, his voice rising. What happened to Tom? I can't rightly say, said his father. One minute we were talking, and the next moment he wouldn't speak to me. He was listening to the opposing coach at the same time as me. I think he got confused. He was like that when you were kids, too. Tom always did tend to misunderstand what I said. You won't do that, will you? But where's Tom, Dad? Tell me what happened to Tom. But his father was already gone, vanished into thin air. Or maybe he was still there, but right behind him. Always just behind him, just out of sight. Dad! he said. Dad? He paced back and forth anxiously for a moment, but he couldn't stop thinking about Tom. Tom was his older brother, born nine minutes earlier, and he had always looked up to him, and they had always looked out for each other. It was almost like they weren't a full person unless the other one was there, that together they were two people but that one of them, taken separately, wasn't even one, which was what made guarding the compound door alone so hard sometimes. What was it his dad had said? That Tom had stopped talking? Maybe he was just mad at dad. Tim didn't understand how you could get mad at dad. Dad was a great guy, but Tom often had been and sometimes stopped talking to him. Maybe that was part of being the older brother. But maybe it was more than that. Maybe there was something else wrong. He owed it to Tom to check on him. After all, wouldn't Tom have done the same thing for him? And if he didn't do it, and then something turned out to be wrong with Tom, how could he even manage to forgive himself? There was only the problem of the door. He was guarding the door, he needed someone to watch the door while he was gone. Dad? he asked. Could you do it? Why, sure, son, said his father. He was just lighting his pipe. What do you want me to do? Take this, said Tim, and gave him the gun. His father couldn't hold on to the gun, dropped it to the floor. That was okay, Tim thought. He could pick it up later, after he'd finished his pipe. If anyone comes, he said, pump em full of lead. 
His father grinned. Will do, son, he said, and gave Tim a little wave. Yes, sir, thought Tim, as he headed down the hall in search of Tom. His father was a good egg, that was for certain. He was certainly understanding. Not everybody was lucky enough to have a father like that. He smelled his brother before he saw him, though he didn't know it was his brother at first. All he knew was that he smelled blood, and that it was coming from their room. He went into a crouch and moved in, balanced on the balls of his feet, ready for someone to attack. But the attack never came. His brother was in bed, turned on his side. Tom, he said to him, Dad said you weren't talking to him. Is anything wrong? Tom didn't say anything. Tom, he said. Not only did he not say anything, but he didn't even move. Tim pulled forward and touched his shoulder. He was cold to the touch. Tim suddenly couldn't breathe. Tim pulled him toward him, and he came all at once, and Tim saw that his throat was cut, and that there was a knife in his hand. 51. Have you seen this? asked Stevens. Crax was with him, standing just behind. Seen what? asked Markov. Stevens reached out and opened the vid. It was just broadcast, he said, still fresh. They stood there together, watching it. It showed Altman before a podium at a press conference. The tickers on the podium ran the line, Scientist accuses military of cover-up, and then alien life confirmed. Altman was describing the marker and the expedition. Where is this? asked Markov. Washington, D.C., he said. How the hell did he get to Washington, D.C.? He turned to Stevens, who in turn looked at Crax. Crax shrugged. Security failure, he said. Not my man, he claimed. Leftovers from Tanner. Every evidence that we are talking about is the first evidence of alien life, said Altman. But this is not something that the military should be investigating. This is something that should be investigated by scientists from all the sectors, a coalition of experts from all over the world. Altman's image disappeared, was replaced by images of the marker itself, taken from the underwater chamber. Where the fuck did he get those? asked Markov. I don't know, said Crax. Find out who does. The military wants to cover it up, Altman was claiming. They want to control the investigation so as to use the alien technology to manufacture weapons. We cannot let this happen. There needs to be a public inquiry about the marker's use and its function. Below him, on the ticker, were the words Michael Altman, whistleblower or paranoid. Crax had already started for the door when Markov stopped him. Stevens was speaking to Markov, whispering quietly, both of them just far enough away that Crax couldn't hear anything. He watched Markov nod, then nod again. Belay that, said Markov to Crax. You can worry about it when you get back. Find out the hotel Altman is staying in, and make whatever arrangements you need to book us into the neighboring room. Handpick three additional men. I want us all on a plane fifteen minutes ago. We need to stamp out this problem right away. Part 6 Hell Unleashed 52 It had been a long day. First the press conference, then other questions, individual interviews. The first one he tried with Ada at his side, but her obsession with the ghost of her mother made her come out as a nut. For the others, he tried to stick to the basics. Yes, there was an alien artifact that they dubbed the Marker. Yes, 
it had been found at the heart of Chicxulub crater under layers of rock, which suggested that it might well be older than human life. No, this was not a hoax. Yes, he was convinced that the military was trying to cover up the existence of the marker. What the rest of the government did or did not know, he couldn't say. He did not bring up the hallucinations. He wanted to avoid the notion that the marker was sentient, and in any case, he wasn't sure the hallucinations really came from the marker. Maybe they were simply triggered by it. He didn't talk about the strange creature on the beach, or show them the sign of the tail of the devil, or tell them that the Yucatec Maya believed the devil's tail was deep beneath the waves, just where the marker had been found. Most media outlets, he quickly realized, saw him as an interesting curiosity, an extremist whom they could parade before their viewers and listeners. They were more interested in poking holes in the story. Couldn't the vid be faked? How did they know that it was actually the size he said it was? Size could be simulated on a vid, and there were no human figures in the vid to compare it to. Hadn't he gone to Chicxulub to work on a university research grant? Then how it was that he ended up working for the military, living on this alleged floating island? Didn't that sound a little too much, like something out of a sci-fi novel? But there were a few people who asked more serious questions, and once he had answered, they looked at him in a different, more thoughtful way. They arrived at the historic Watergate Hotel late past midnight. There was another round of interviews the next day, requests still coming in over the phone. Also, a meeting with a lawyer about possibly filing an injunction against the government. Public opinion seemed to be building. Maybe it would be enough to apply the right amount of pressure on the places that needed it. It's going to work, Ada said as he opened the door. Markov won't be able to keep the marker for himself. Everyone will know about it now. Everyone can have a chance to share in its message. Not knowing what to say, he didn't answer. They opened the door. He flipped on the light, and then stopped dead. One of the walls had a large hole in it, plaster scattered all over the floor. Just behind it, sitting in a chair beside the bed, was Markov. Hello, Altman, he said. Altman started to turn toward the door, but found a gun with a silencer on its end pointed at his eye. Another pointed at Ada's chest. Crax was holding one, a guard he didn't recognize the other. There were two more guards deeper in the room. They came forward now. I don't need to tell you that I'll shoot your girlfriend first. No screaming, said Crax. Nothing but polite silence unless you're spoken to. Do you understand? Altman nodded. Move into the room, he said. Get on the bed. They moved in, were pushed onto the bed. Crax stepped back and sat in a chair that he'd set up across the threshold of the bathroom, keeping his gun trained at Altman. I take it you've seen the press conference? said Altman. Shut up, Altman, said Markov. Nobody likes a smart ass. It's too late, Markov, hissed Ada. Word is out. Markov ignored her. Let's have a little talk, Altman, he said. Talking can't hurt, can it? Altman didn't say anything. I don't suppose we could encourage you to drop everything, Markov said. Hold another press conference. Let them know that you were only joking, that there is no marker, that there is no conspiracy, that you've been the victim of an incredible hoax. No, said Altman. If you do, said Markov, we could come to some sort of arrangement. You'd be allowed to come back to research the marker. When Altman didn't say anything, he added, with total access. Total access? It was tempting, 
but no doubt Markov was lying. And in any case, he was far enough along that there was no going back. The marker had to be investigated openly. He doesn't answer to you, said Ada. He answers only to the marker. Markov reached out, coughed her hard. You shut up, he said. Don't touch her, said Altman. What's your answer, Altman? asked Markov. I'm sorry, said Altman. No. I'm sorry too, said Markov. That's it then. You're going to have to come with us. I don't think so, said Altman. We're not asking you if you want to come or not. We're giving you the choice between coming or dying. Then kill me, said Altman without hesitation. Markov looked at him coolly. Call me superstitious, but I think the marker has something in store for you. I don't want to kill you yet. Markov nodded toward Ada, and Krax's gun slowly swiveled until it was pointed at Ada's head. But I don't have the same reservations about your girlfriend. Altman looked over at Ada. She didn't look afraid, but it was that very fact that made him afraid. She was eager to die a martyr. So the choice is either both of us go with you, or just I go, he said. Markov smiled. Got it all in one, he said. Cracks here has a sedative for both of you. He gestured to the others. These fine boys will repair the hole we made, make everything as good as new. As far as anyone knows, you simply got cold feet and disappeared. You're a real bastard, said Altman. Takes one to no one, said Markov. Now be a good boy and take your medicine. 